I really do appreciate all of you, and I'm so happy that I could come back to the Louisiana camp meeting. Uh, I've been to many of them. The first one that I came to was in 1950, and they had the youth services before the main service. One night I preached, and the next night the Tenney preached. So we go way back, and I've enjoyed these wonderful years of our association and friendship with them. And he preached an outstanding, outstanding message at our camp meeting last Friday. Not soon forget that message. I introduced him by saying he was one of the most consistent men that I've ever been around always consistent in his prayer life and in his love for the Word. We have been together overseas. We've been together all over the states. Uh, we have enjoyed a lot of good things together. But I would have to say for your superintendent, he never was ever too busy that he didn't have his prayer time and never too busy that he didn't have time for the Word of God. Those consistencies in his life has made him the leader that he is, one that is loved and respected by so many people, and I love and appreciate him and all of these leaders here. Last Friday night had to be one of the greatest services that I was ever in. Your own brother Tom Barnes came over and we had healing service and Holy Ghost rally. We had a record crowd. The Sheriff's Department said at least 200 cars couldn't get in to park and they left. And uh, people were standing around the auditorium. We had a youth tabernacle filled with young people. And Brother Barnes ministered. I, you know, he has such a good walk with God that a man like him gets, gets up and starts talking, you start feeling something. My wife wouldn't have it any other way that, but that he would be there on the platform during our ladies' conference. And uh, you know, when you really live close to God and walk with God, you can, all he did one day is just step up to the pulpit and said, he's here. And when he did, the place just exploded. You don't, you don't get that by accident. You, you don't. That just doesn't naturally happen. That happens because of a consistent walk with God, and you've got a lot to be thankful for having a good man like Brother Tom Barnes, who ministers all over our fellowship by way of telephone. And uh, what is so amazing to me, when you want to talk to Brother Barnes, you don't have to go through a secretary that turns you to another secretary that finally gets a uh, hold of somebody else. He usually always picks up the phone. God has given him a very unique ministry, and it's so needed. I pray the Lord will keep him around here until the trumpet sounds. Amen. I, I had thought I'd be preaching over there to the preachers and their wives. I, I didn't read my correspondence well enough, and we're shifted back here. But while you're standing, if you'll turn in your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn, first of all, to the book of the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, in the 26th chapter, verse 36... Matthew 26, 36, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Pray, or tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, it be possible that this cup pass from me. And nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. 
And it cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, saith unto Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples, and saith unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. Son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. And then turn to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 33. And this has become a favorite scripture of mine, favorite passage. Exodus 33 and 18. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Now, have you ever prayed that prayer? Have you ever desired to see his glory? Uh, we've seen it around here many times, haven't we? We still want to see it. Never get enough. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee and will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me. Everybody say that. Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. Praise God. Don't you love the word of the Lord? Amen. I'm not going to hold you very long. In fact, I was so worn out after all of our meetings in Texas. I pled with Brother Tenney to let me off, and then he wouldn't do it. And uh, <clears throat> I thought I was going to be preaching over there a while ago, and Sister Joan... And my wife asked me if I wanted an M&M. &M. They were passing out M&Ms over there. I said, no, what I need is an A&A. &A. Anointing and more anointing. <clears throat> but uh, it's so good to be here. You love the Lord today? You may be seated. God bless you. Let's give the Lord a good hand clap of thanksgiving. <laughs> Praise God. Committed to prayer, God's divine imperative. When I speak of prayer, I'm talking about an untapped power. When I speak of prayer, I speak of our greatest resource. Prayer is God's chosen method. God has chosen prayer to be the vehicle that we communicate with him. He has chosen the method of prayer for defeating the devil, saving the sinner, restoring the backslider, strengthening the saint, sending forth labors, curing the sick, glorifying his name, accomplishing the impossible, giving good things, imparting wisdom, bestowing peace, keeping one from sin, revealing his will to our lives. What does it mean to be committed? I think of Abraham, he kind of stands at the top of the list, and uh, I preached one year here, and because of the times on Abraham's seven altars, he had the altar of separation, the altar of revelation, the altar of consecration, the altar of dedication, the altar of covenant relationship with God, the altar of intercession, and the altar of worship. He didn't stay stray very far from the altar. When I think of Moses, I think of intimacy, his intimate relationship with God. And this is the thing that we need to think about for a few minutes, relationship. We've been talking about that over in the tabernacle, ministers, their wives, the relationship. But <clears throat> let's talk about our relationship with Almighty God. 
Exodus 33, Moses on the mount, his cry here is, is the same cry that the apostle Paul had in Philippians, the third chapter, when he prayed, I beseech thee, O Lord, show me thy glory. Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. God said, there is a place. Everybody say, there is a place. Have you found it yet? If you haven't found it, you can. There is a place. And that's the place where you develop your relationship with Almighty God. It is a safe place. It's a holy place. It's a special place. This place is reserved for the hungry. It's reserved for those who are committed. Jesus was, I guess, our greatest example of prayer, and his example of commitment is seen in the four Gospels. Over and over you hear of him praying. He prayed early in the morning. He prayed late at night. He prayed all night. He prayed before he did anything. But there's only one of his prayers that is recorded. The recorded prayer was the one that he wanted to impress upon us more than anything, and that was the prayer in Gethsemane. It was in Gethsemane that he learned that intimacy that came to him all over again. He learned dependency, and he learned obedience. So in that place of developing a relationship, there has to be intimacy, dependency, and obedience. Try as hard as we will with methods, techniques, talents, with our ability. And just keep on trying to produce revival with that. And I want to tell you that lasting revival does not come by methods and means. Revival is always a sovereign move of God. And to bring that about, there's only one thing that can bring revival, and that's prayer. Prayer is the key. God doesn't come down on methods. God doesn't come down on techniques. God doesn't come down on talents. He just simply said, Jeremiah 33 and 3, Call unto me, and I will answer, and will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. There was a large congregation, a great gathering of people that came together one time, and a great orator was there, and they were calling for him to recite something beautiful because with his training and his mannerism, everybody thoroughly enjoyed it. And so he agreed on the condition that an old preacher friend of his there would also say something for the Lord. So he got up and in all of his oratorical ability quoted Psalms 23. There wasn't... Uh, there wasn't any motion. Nobody was moving. They were held spellbound at the way that he could say it. And when he got through, everybody clapped their hands and they cheered. Then the old preacher got up and quoted the same psalm. But when he got through, there was not a dry eye in the house. Everybody was moved to the depths of their spirit through that dear man and his way of quoting the psalm. So the orator got back up and said, Folks, I touched your eyes and I touched your ears today, but this dear minister has touched your heart. He said, The difference is, I know the 23rd psalm, but he knows the shepherd. That only comes about with a divine relationship with Almighty God. Praise God. There is a place by me. There is a place by me. I remember years ago at a conference in Kansas City, a young man was to sing who had been singing in nightclubs and had audiences all over uh, the country and 
Most people didn't know his lifestyle was that of a homosexual. And they slipped him in there, and he sang. And I watched that congregation because I had told Brother Urshan that that boy should have never been at the pulpit singing. He didn't know, and of course the committee had put him up there. I watched that congregation to see how they would respond to a man who had a lifestyle like his. And they sat there, and they they were fascinated with the way he could sing. But when he got through, I didn't hear one amen. I didn't hear one thank the Lord. I didn't hear one praise go up. And I thought to myself, this is wonderful. Our people may have listened, and they may have even enjoyed it, but it did not touch them and affect them, and they did not respond to it. That same night, one of our young preachers got up to sing, This is my story. This is my song. Blessed Assurance. And I watched that same congregation as they rose to their feet, worshiping and loving and magnifying the Lord. What was the difference? One was talent. The other was relationship. It all boils down to our relationship with God. Many know how to preach and are even blessed to preach, but have never developed a relationship. And I want to say to every young preacher here today, sometime or other, or another, if your ministry is ever going to be effective, it's going to be because you have developed a relationship with Jesus Christ. <clears throat> there are many talented people that have stood on our platforms through the years, and some have left us and gone for bigger things. What, why did they do that? Uh, they were talented. You, when you'd hear them sing, they were uh, you just knew how to do it. You enjoyed it so much. They learned how to perform, but they never did learn how to respond to the Spirit of God. And they could be bought off. One young lady said, Why should I sing in the United Pentecostal Churches? when I can make a thousand dollars a night singing in charismatic churches. The will of God can only come through a relationship. You've got to develop a relationship sometime or another. And that will only come as you are committed to prayer. I'm just talking to you out of my heart. I remember as in my teenage years, I I knew everything about Pentecost. I knew every verse of every song. And I could sing it louder than anybody in the church. I knew how to go through the motions. But I woke up when I was about 18 years old to realize I, I'm just going through the motions. I, I'm not a being affected. Some, something is missing there is a missing element in my life. And I wanted to say it took me one full year because when I realized that I really didn't know whether I had the Holy Ghost or not, it scared me so badly that I got my roommate to get up with me at 6 o'clock every morning for a year. We went to that cold church when it was in the winter time and we were there when it was hot in the summer he was a young man that was on fire for God and about the time his knees would touch the ground he was already in a prayer spirit and I was struggling and struggling and fighting and battling and I've just got to have a breakthrough and and I for one solid year I kept trying, but I was committed to it for one year. And that one year paid off because at about the end of that year, uh, the devil kept telling me, God doesn't love you. You're going to be lost. And, and uh, I was listening, and I would wake up every morning so depressed and, 
and with unpredictable feelings and I was living with my sister and brother-in-law at that time and and my sister Blanche told me she was always worried about me because I always was in such a depressed state and it was all because of the turmoil that was going on I was trying to find my place and to find out if the Lord really loved me and so one Sunday night I'll never forget I I knew how to sing I knew how to go through the motions I played my guitar at every service and sang my special song I was involved in everything but I did not have a relationship with God that Sunday night I had been going and praying for myself. I said, no, I'm going to help somebody else. If I never get it, I'm going to help somebody else get it. I never forget helping pray a friend through to the Holy Ghost that had been speaking, seeking for it for about 10 years. And what a wonderful feeling it was. I was holding his arms up and others were praying. And the Holy Ghost came upon him. Clarence Ledbetter started speaking with other tongues. And when it happened to him, it was like warm water at the end of my fingertips came down into my hands, down my arm, down through my body, and I began to speak with other tongues and magnify the Lord. And I went... I went to bed that night. I wet my pillow with tears of thanksgiving that the Lord loved me. The Lord showed me in that experience that he really did love me. When I woke up the next morning, I was anxious to find out if it was still there. All I had to do was say, thank you, Jesus. When I did, the tears started flowing again. I began to feel it all over again. Over again. I developed a relationship with that experience. I want to tell you that there has never been one day in all of these many years later that I have ever doubted that the Lord loved me. I broke through that. Something happened to me. I'll never forget it. And I, I, my sister said, I am so glad because I had to pick you up every day and, and uh, carry you along. But thank God when it comes... And I'll tell you, with that breakthrough, every morning, without exception, I wake up with a song. I, I'm singing it in my heart and mind. I did it again this morning. You can only do that as you're committed to prayer. It took me one year, but when I got my breakthrough, ever since then, 40-some years later, I wake up every morning with a song, and that's the Lord's sweet communion with my own spirit. Well, I'll praise Him in this place. <laughs> praise God. I'm talking about relationship that you can have with God that will give you that assurance that the Lord loves you, that He's with you, and you can commune with Him, and you can talk with Him on a day-by-day -day basis. My, my dear, sweet, old-fashioned mother, we'd go into places, my dad go to preach and start a church, and she uh, was not a singer. And sure, her testimony was always very simple, but oh, how she knew how to pray. And uh, where you're in a congregation, two, three, four hundred people, and only my dad and mother with the Holy Ghost, and dad would get up there to preach, and a lot of times it would be a battle and a struggle, and, and my mother would slip over behind the piano. And she would kneel and in her quiet way begin to commune with God. And first thing you know, my dad was anointed and he took off preaching and people came to the altars. It was his message, all right. It was the word of God. But it was a little prayer warrior who had a good communication with the Lord and relationship and was able to help get a breakthrough. Praise God. She didn't know how to read. My mother's 
Her father was killed six weeks before she was born, and uh, her mother had to work hard, and my mother had to stay home. She didn't get to go to school, and she couldn't read. But through the, through the relationship she developed with the Lord, she would pick up her Bible, and she would turn, and she would stumble with the first few words. And then she told us there was always a little voice that would come and just read all those lines and those verses, and that's relationship. That's relationship with God. And you know, when you live in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit like she did all the time, I was I did some things that was wrong, but I don't know why I did. I never did enjoy of it, any of it, because I knew that God was flashing it on the wall at home. And my mother was seeing every move that I made. And if I got with the wrong company, she'd, I'd come home, she'd say, Son, who were you with today? I said, Well... Nobody said, oh, yes, son, now don't tell me a story. God showed me you were with the wrong crowd today. Well, that's quite a relationship when you can just see everything that's going on way miles away. And I don't, uh, you know, uh, you don't doubt those things when you live with it. In fact, she told my wife one time, mother gave birth to ten children and, and, uh, she said to my wife, said, I got, I, I began to get embarrassed here. We were traveling all over the country and taking our families with us and had to sleep in church houses and all of that. And so finally one day I just prayed and I said, now, Lord, if you don't mind, I don't believe that I need any more children. And said, the Lord heard my prayer. Now, it takes a real relationship with God to get something through like that. My wife said, oh, Mom, I, I'd have prayed that prayer after about the sixth one. She said, you better be glad I didn't. You got number nine. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Relationship, so very important. And if you'll commit yourself to prayer and stay with it, I'll give you a good hint. Enter into a covenant with God for 30 days and see what he will do. I can promise you at the end of that 30 days, there will be something moving in your heart. You will have learned how to pray, consistent in prayer, regularly praying, and you'll not want to stop. I thought about Solomon, read about him a little bit this morning. He was given wisdom. He was really given wisdom. He understood a lot of things. The world beat a path to his doorstep. Just to hear the wisdom. He uttered 3,000 proverbs and sung 1,005 songs, the Bible said. He was acquainted with all the affairs of life. Every affair of life became a real disappointment. Wealth and all the women that he married, the wine, the works, and the wisdom even said that was folly. But if you'll notice one thing about Solomon, he relied on the gift that God gave him but he never developed a real relationship with God. Outside of the prayer that he prayed at the dedication of the temple, you don't hear of him going to the Lord and humbling himself. But then you look at David. David, throughout his writings, there was always a dialogue between him and Almighty God. Amen. There were definite qualities and characteristics that caused David to stand out. Saul stood above, but David stood out. And it took the writer in Acts 13, 22, when Paul was addressing the synagogue in uh, Antioch, he said, David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. David had his hardships. 
He had his difficulties. He carried a lot of burdens. He had a lot of failings in his life. Even sinned. But when you read Psalms 51, you read his heartbeat. Because he wanted that relationship with, with God more than anything. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew in me the right spirit. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. There's something special that you've given me, Lord, and I've got to have that relationship more than anything else in this world. He learned a lot of things in that relationship with God. He learned a lesson when he was tending the sheep. He always had a heart to want to protect the innocent. Even from the bear and the lion, he was not afraid. When he faced an army and a giant that roared against him, he said, is there not a cause? The feeling that he had for those animals was carried over in his love for God's people. He stood for what was right when he had to stand alone. And he learned through that relationship how to deal with jealousy. You read Psalm, uh, 1 Samuel 18, how Saul was so jealous, but because David had such a walk with God through his prayer life, he was able to deal with the jealousy, and he would not take vengeance upon an enemy. If you have a relationship with God, you won't do it. Amen. There are some people, they know the latest. They know everything that's going on. And if you want to know, all you have to do is pick up the phone. And my wife and I made an agreement many years ago that we were not interested in, have you heard the latest? Amen. We just do our best to love everybody. My old dad taught me, look for the good in everybody. There's some good somewhere. If you look for the bad, you'll find it. But always look for the good. And I really appreciate the fact that we've had altars in our lives that's helped us. The first seven years of my pastoral ministry were the hardest years of my life. I went through anonymous letters on a weekly basis. I went through the fact that there were people that thought I was too young to be their pastor and I couldn't feed them. And I preached my heart out knowing that every direction I looked in that little auditorium, somebody would be rebuking the devil or uh, could hear the leave of their Bible as they were going through their Bible or had their head down and shaking it and praying. I had to go through all of that. But you know what saved me? Every day I had to go back to that church. I have the altar bench in front of my own pulpit now in Houston. I knelt at that altar every day for seven years, two hours a day. When I was in town, when I was out of town, of course I prayed other places. But every day that I was in Paris, and I've often told people if I ever amounted to anything, I would have to give those people that worked against me credit for it. My, life, my wife doesn't like me to say that, but they are the ones that kept me on my knees. Because I was able to develop a relationship with God, I was able to establish my ministry. And when I'd go to the pulpit, there were times I wanted to use the word as a hammer and just beat people over the head, but the Holy Ghost would speak to me, and you can't do that. And so hearing from the Lord was so important in my life. David also, in that relationship, learned how to weep over the death of an enemy. And in that relationship, even though he could not build the temple, God permitted him at least to get the materials together. So I have certain fears I don't mind to tell you. I've 
got a stack of sermons and I know that I've been able to draw from the past but I also know that if I'm going to hear the voice of the Spirit I've got to push aside a lot of things I told my wife a while back I said I've, God's dealing with me I'm, I'm going to take some time off for fasting and prayer she said well where are you going I said I don't know I'll go somewhere where I can go to a good Pentecostal church and pray in the daytime and at night. And I got to thinking I couldn't go anywhere without somebody recognizing me and knowing me, kind of like the preacher that was going to take a vacation with his family. And he went into church with a sports shirt on and tried to comb his hair differently and sat back there and the pastor kept looking back. Finally got up and said, Aren't you, brother, so-and-so? You know, it's kind of hard to get away from people. So you have to do some other things. Instead of going out of town, I stayed right at home, right there in my church for three days. And when people would leave around midnight, I'd slip in that auditorium, and I'd pull that altar bench out, and I would lie on the floor weeping between the porch and the altar, for three days I did that. No, never didn't converse with anybody. My wife couldn't talk to me. There was nothing happened but just a time of committing myself to prayer. When I left there, I'm sure that I didn't preach a great sermon, but oh, how I felt. There are times you just have to withdraw from everything and shut everything out turn aside to see what the Lord would have for you. The only way to know the will of God is through that relationship. Amen. It's not enough to know the truth about God. We learn that through His Word. By spending time with Him, we learn to know Him. I like what I read about the Azusa Street Revival. No flesh was permitted, ever permitted to glory in his presence. The rich had to humble themselves and never be given special place or special honor. The intellectual could never display their ability. The talented never display their talents. No speakers were announced ahead of time. No subjects announced ahead of time. They had to depend entirely on the leading of the Lord. But it said there never was a day or night that someone was not slain under the power of God. Relationship. Committed to prayer. You can find that relationship with God. Let me close by telling you that there is a place by him there are four experiences that every preacher needs you need that ex experience of reassurance you need the experience of your relationship with God in regard to your call to preaching the gospel and you need the experience of that relationship and knowing that you are in the will of God and you need that experience for revival breakthrough. I told you about God giving me the reassurance that was at an altar. When I started preaching, I got out in the Mojave Desert, had a car wreck right out in the middle of the desert. I pulled out over across the road and my fenders of my car were bent in and the air was going out of my tires and and the water was steaming out of my radiator hit a rock and forced the fan into the radiator and I looked at that car all bent up the air going out of the tires and 20 miles from nowhere it was about 4 o'clock in the morning devil said 
you really think you're called to preach? So I told my buddy to catch a ride to the nearest town and get a record and come back. And I walked way out in the desert. And the, the ground was hard and crusty and wind beaten, weather beaten. And I'll never forget digging two little holes in the sand, that hard sand, so I could put my knees in. And I said, now, Lord, I've got to settle something. Either I am or I'm not. And you're the only one that can let me know. And I prayed and I cried. And the sun began to come up. And it was so hot, I began to perspire. Dust blew on my face where the tears were. And I was an ugly looking sight. My clothes were all messed up and soaked with perspiration when I finally walked away from that spot. I said, Lord, I know you called me to preach. And if I have to walk or if I have to hitchhike, I'm going to preach your gospel. I walked back to that old car and I had a different feeling when I walked back than I did when I left. I settled some things. God gave me the reassurance. When I went to Houston, this is my 39th year to pastor there. Every time I've stood in that pulpit, Brother Tenney, I have known that I was in the will of God. It came through one full month of committing myself to prayer. I prayed earnestly, I prayed desperately, and my little girl asked her mother, said, why does daddy call a prayer meeting every time he comes home? And I was trying to find the will of God, but it ended up on a Saturday night. Family had prayed till our girls went to sleep. We put them to bed. About midnight, my wife went on to bed. I'll never forget that night as long as I lived. I stretched out on that floor and I wept until I didn't think I could ever weep anymore. I was desperate. Oh, how desperate I was. I wanted the will of God for my life where God wanted me to go. And, but I'll never forget after I had travailed and wept all night Sometime around 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, the Lord Jesus walked right in that room. And I said to myself, this is what I have waited for all of my life. Now I'm going to see him. But I couldn't lift my head up. I couldn't even reach my hand out. All my strength left me. I couldn't touch him, but he touched me. He laid his hand on me, and when he did, the tears started gushing. I, there was not tears of sorrow. It was not tears of travail. It was tears of love and of joy and knowing that he had touched me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And I, I'm going to tell you today, folks, that happened to me 39 years ago. And I have not had one day of discouragement in 39 years because he touched me. Now, you tell me you can't go on a touch when you commit yourself in earnest desire to seek God, to hear from God, and you're committed to it. You can develop a relationship, my friend. Oh, what a beautiful feeling it is. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Oh, thank him with me, would you? Glory. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. And then when I needed a revival in my church, 
seven hours in an attic when again I was perspiring until my clothes were soaking wet. God gave me a revival breakthrough. Hallelujah. And it's been a continuous breakthrough, brethren. I'm telling you, it's there for you. Commit to prayer and you develop a relationship. Hallelujah. Glory. <laughs> I feel the Holy Ghost doing a work out here right now. Stand to your feet. Thank him together. Blessed be the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. And when you get a breakthrough, there's just a continuous breakthrough ever so often. Just last Sunday, day before yesterday, 39 people received the Holy Ghost in my church, the most that's ever happened in one day. Relationship, committed to prayer, breakthrough, touch from God. That's what it's all about. Oh, how many preachers are here today? Wave your hand at me. Hallelujah. Brethren, let's not rely on anything but the help that God will give us. That's the motivating force that keeps us going. You can read books and get ideas, and you can have talent and ability, but always remember my relationship with God is the most important thing in the world. Reach out and lay your hand on the person next to you and unselfishly pray for them that God will bring us to this place of prayer.